Are you awake? I thought I heard you get up. Yeah, I'm awake. Sorry, I just can't sleep. Are you thinking about about him? Yeah, a bit. You should get back to sleep, my love. I'm fine. No, no, it's okay. What else is on your mind? I don't know. It seems weird, but I had one of the most vivid dreams of my life. I saw a fox on a snowy mountain, just looking confused and worried. Those eyes. I can't get those eyes out of my head. She was running in the windy snow, looking for something. Do you think it has to do with with you and what's been going on? I don't know. It was just a dream, Rachel. They're not meant to make sense. A lot's happened the past couple days, that's all. Well, if you're not going to sleep anyway, you should tell me. I want to hear. All right. So, not far from her home, she followed that path to something unexpected. She couldn't stay, though. She had to find her other two children. So she took that path. She followed it towards something ancient. Something with answers. The fox looked high and low, searching for any sign of her cubs. Points of light showed the way to this ancient tree. It was as if each one had a story to tell, all their own. The land was trying to tell my story, too. I felt like I was right behind her the whole time. As a kid, did you ever do show and tell in your class? Yeah, I, I think I only did it once, when I was in the fourth grade. You know how my life was around then. I wanted to show my class what helped pass the time and distracted me, so I brought a dozen paper cranes I had made. I think I told everyone how badly I wanted to be a bird and fly, embarrassingly enough. Don't be embarrassed. Every kid wants to fly. For me, it was another toy for my dad, a wooden boat. I remember guarding it so carefully in my hands as I walked into class. When I sat down, a group of boys immediately made fun of it. They asked which trash can I found it in, or why an ugly log was my favorite toy. When I got up, I didn't even want to tell them my dad had carved it. I said it was a joke gift my friends had given me. Kids can be so cruel. Some of them are. I shouldn't have let them get to me, but it did. It's amazing we bounce back at all. Do you remember what my dad did for a living? Wasn't he like a lumberjack? <laughs> That's one way of putting it. 
If wood was a canvas, then a carving knife was his paintbrush. Even after working a 50-hour week, even after his hands were more splinters than skin, he would bring home the nicest piece of Alaskan weeping cedar and make me toys. That wooden train was the first toy I can remember, and I loved it. I just knew from a young age I was going to be a lumberjack, like my father. Usually those kids would leave me alone, but somehow they could tell I was different. They made fun of how far away I lived. They called my dad a sourdough. I was a blabbermouth as a kid, telling my dad stories I made up for hours. But after that show and tell, I didn't tell him much anymore. He didn't know exactly what was wrong, but his best guess was that the toys he carved weren't cool enough. He carved me a tank and tried to tell me what it was like to be in a real tank as a serviceman. I didn't know your dad was in the military. Yeah, in the army. The sad thing is that I'd pretty much forgotten until just now. There's so much I still don't know about him. I'm sorry. He knows how much you love him. You're going to see him again soon and have some closure, I'm sure. myself, why talk to anybody anyway? Why bother when I'm happy by myself? I started drawing a lot, mostly animals I saw in the woods by my home. I then imagined designing my own hideouts with things like TVs and pantries full of chips and cookies. I think that idea of leaving home and drawing blueprints started my career. I found a lot of solace in that. I'm not surprised, but I did the same thing, you know? There is something special about having a place to call your own. And now look at us. Well, if you count renting in an overpriced city. <laughs> it's as close as we can get for now.
My teenage years were full of sketching, angst, and trouble. I wasn't popular or unpopular. Maybe just forgettable. I guess that gave me a sense of freedom. So I hung out with crazy kids, doing crazy things, even though I mostly just watched the chaos ensue. We did it all. Put fireworks in mailboxes, hide roadkill in people's garages, break windows of the barber shop in Anchorage. My dad was furious, but he was so busy working he couldn't do much to stop me from going out. I think being an adult means there's no one to stop you making hard decisions. He had to make a living, and he couldn't be in two places at once. Yeah, I realize that now. But at the time, I was sure he was more interested in growing his business than what was going on with me. He was working another late night, and my friends were over, saying how bored they were and how they had come all the way out to my house for nothing. One of them mentioned how that old, ugly beyond belief truck was still in the garage, and how we should take it for a spin. I was only 15, so I kind of fought it for a while. The next thing I knew, we were careening around the mountain path, rocks spitting onto the sides of the cliff while my dad's cringeworthy bluegrass blared out the speakers. I drove while my friends were in the back of that yellow and purple truck, throwing beer bottles and trash at anything remotely interesting. Felt like I was soaring in the air with borrowed wings. But all good things have endings. A cop outside of Eagle River pulled us over after he saw us in a bottle rocket into someone's yard. What followed was a long night of talking to disappointed adults and feeling smaller than ever. After he drove me home from the police station, I blew up at him, saying how I never wanted to be like him, how I was going to be someone and leave that hick icebox for good. He just looked forward at the road with tired eyes. I took out that bluegrass tape from the cassette deck and chucked it out the window. In my sage teenage wisdom, I thought I had proved the ultimate point, but my dad had a different idea. He slammed the brakes slowly bowed his head while gripping the steering wheel and finally looked at me. All he said, like it was a polite request, was, make this right. I sat there in silence fuming, but I eventually got out and combed every square inch of the woods, muttering profanity after profanity. I found it 30 minutes later, near a small waterfall off the road. I went back to the truck, Put the wet tape back in, and sure enough it worked. We didn't speak another word to each other the rest of the night. Wow, I knew you were a crazy teenager, but... It's hard to believe, isn't it? Surprises me too. It's like I didn't really know who that kid was back then. I bet my dad thought the same thing over and over. It's almost like he was saying, make this right to himself, more than to me.
friends would laugh about that night and talk about how crazy it was. And I laughed along, pretending it didn't bother me. But it did. I imagined my friends growing old in the bush, unable to find that thrill in those godforsaken ice fields. It's like those mountains were a literal wall, keeping me from leaving, where all I would have to look forward to are lumber yards and evening beers. I had to climb over. That was my only goal for a long time. If there was some way I could take my love of drawing and turn it into a way of escape, nothing would make me happier. I wanted to create instead of tearing trees down. I wanted to move to the lower 48, not because I hated it there in Alaska, but I hated the idea of it. It's like all of that spite inside me had created this monster which followed me around my whole teenage years. I put so much energy into doing what others didn't expect of me. Why did I do that? There's one fact you're forgetting, though. If you didn't have that fire in you, we probably would have never met. You're absolutely right. Maybe the destination is all that matters in the end. But then why am I awake? Why am I seeing this fox go on her journey? And why can't I stop thinking about my dad? Even at my most distant, at the times when I detested him the most, he kept reaching out. For a year straight, he asked me every week when we were going camping. 
I thought he was just dense. Eventually, to shut him up, I agreed. We carried out the worn lawn chairs from the garage and set up a cinder block campfire at the site we'd always used behind the house. We walked down the mountain path, talking in the warm sunshine we only got a couple months of the year. Those three obsidian rocks shimmered alongside the shore, almost like sparklers pressed against a dark window. I'll never forget that wet stone on my feet, or how those massive mountains looked even bigger in the lake's reflection. I felt small, but grateful. As the sun set, my dad found something I hadn't seen for a long time. The tree where I'd made my first carving when I was six. I hadn't even carved it. My dad had helped me, but I still called it my tree. Something about seeing my name there made me open up, and we talked about everything that night in that old camouflage tent. I told him how much I loved sketching and design, and how it would be a dream to study architecture in Seattle. I told him how I didn't get along with my friends much anymore, but that I didn't mind being alone. He told me he was there for me, and he joked that if all he had to do was write my name on a tree to finally get me to talk, he would have left me carved logs with novels on them in front of my room every morning. <laughs> I don't know why it took me that long to realize it, but it was then I knew how much he had sacrificed for me. On our property, there were old abandoned pieces of a shed and car long left unused. I used to ask him all the time who those people were that left all this junk, and I'm sure he got so tired of hearing it that he made up some elaborate stories how a brown bear ate them and haunted the woods afterwards. What's funny is I think it made those people seem more real, growing up thinking they were still hanging out like they couldn't say goodbye. I used to tell my friends how I could swear I saw spirits move near the water, and that always freaked them out. I guess it didn't bother me, because the way I saw it, they were normal people with old cars and sheds, just trying to figure out how to survive and be happy in the middle of nowhere. It was a cool thought that they didn't want to leave, but you know, I was a weird kid. Well, you had good company since those ghosts like living in a place where they were brutally devoured. <laughs> Thank you.
My dad built a lot of stuff in his free time. If he wasn't watching fly fishing or reading Tom Clancy novels, he was carving something. He made tons of birdhouses. Not that he was into bird watching, but I think he really missed working and adding on to the home. If he couldn't afford the time to build onto our own house, he would have to settle with watching birds move into their little homes. We kept an old mattress in the bed of that ugly yellow truck. So we would drive it deep into the woods and then watch the birds fly into their houses while the sun set. Usually it was accompanied by venison jerky or a cold coke, but not a lot of talking, which is how we both liked it. We were happiest underneath the evergreens. We decided it was time to finally map out the hundreds of acres we lived on just to pass the time during the summer. He was only free in the evenings, so I would spend the day wasting time on dial-up internet and sketching, and then we would rush into the woods, pen and map in hand, before evening fell. Sometimes, the aurora borealis would cast a cold green glow on the mountainside and we would finish our route underneath a twilight sky. Sometimes I was lonely during those summer days, but there was comfort in the routine. A lot of teenagers aren't looking for the daily grind, though. There's nothing wrong with wanting to get out, to leave your childhood home. You wanted to progress, to make something of yourself. Yeah, you're right. That house. I'm sure it's the same as how I left it. Then why does it feel so different? I doubt you're the only adult to have looked back and asked that question.
stood nearby, unfazed, like nothing was wrong. But my dad is dead, and he's never coming back, Rachel. I can tell you these stories, but I can never reminisce with him again. He can never hold a grandchild that we'll probably never be able to have. I can never talk to him again, and I'll never be able to say I'm sorry for everything. Good night.